Welcome everyone to the first um, past and present, formerly known as News and Nachos, um, with this panel on the War on Terror at 20. Um, I'm Dr. Becky Hughes. I am the chair of the history department. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this important conversation. Many of you may not have experienced 9-11 as adults, um, but I remember it vividly because I was living on the East Coast at the time and a number of people in my community lost loved ones in the attacks on the Twin Towers. And my husband and I had close friends as well who experienced the trauma of 9-11 on a first-hand basis. The attacks on 9-11 were accompanied by a sinking feeling that they were ushering in a new and troubling future. The 1990s were very much characterized by heavy optimism. With the fall of the Soviet Union, we imagined that democracy would spread across the globe. The new technology of the internet was going to bind us together as never before. And we imagined a new era of, pre of unprecedented prosperity and peace. But instead, the past two decades have been defined largely in part by the U.S. war on terror. As we know, the U.S. waged two simultaneous wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan. But the war on terror encompasses much more than that. It also led to the creation of secret CIA prisons around the world. It led to the creation of Guantanamo Bay, um, the prison in Cuba. It led to lethal drone attacks in places that we were not officially at war with, particularly Pakistan and Somalia. It led to military operations against terrorist targets in Niger and in Kenya. Domestically, it led to the creation of the Homeland Security and to the TSA and to the expansion of surveillance powers of the FBI. It contributed to the profiling of Muslim Americans in the United States. And one study by, the, by Brown University has calculated that the war has cost more than $8 trillion, and it's still counting. Worse, roughly 900,000 people um, were killed across the globe, including US soldiers, foreign fighters, aid workers, journalists, and civilians. The researchers at Brown also calculated that as a direct result of the US wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq, 38 million people have been displaced from their homes. The number does not even include the many who had to flee from their homes this summer in Afghanistan. Over the past century, the scale of displacement has only been surpassed by that of World War II. But what's amazing, and what even is astounding, is that 20 years after the attacks on September 11th, we cannot speak of the war on terror in the past tense. The war on terror officially began September 14, 2001, with Congress passing the authorization for the use of military force but that is not simply history. That authorization is still active today. It was part of why it was difficult to name this event. Um, we can't say the war on terror 20 years later or the 20th anniversary, but rather this is the war on terror at 20 years. We're taking a reading, a moment of reflection at the 20 year mark without knowing how many years are ahead. True, we, we have withdrawn many of our soldiers from Iraq and from Afghanistan, closing some of the most significant chapters of this era. But detainees still languish in Guantanamo Bay. The authorization for the use of military force that was passed in 2001 still remains in effect. And the consequences of the Taliban's return to Afghanistan are only beginning to be understood. 
Moreover, U.S. intelligence services and armed forces continue to operate around the globe to hunt down individuals and groups that are deemed to be posing a threat. So before we continue further down this road, I am very pleased to be able to invite these three speakers to share what lessons we can learn from the past two decades on the war on terror. Um, Dr. Alyssa Walter, she is um, assistant professor of history and her areas of expertise include the history of Iraq and Egypt during the colonial and post-colonial periods with an emphasis on gender and social history. She's currently writing a book about um, the history of Baghdad from 1950 to um, 2011. And here she teaches classes on Middle Eastern history. Um, she teaches a class actually on the US war um, on terror. And she teaches a class on international refugee law. And moreover, she um, frequently serves as an expert witness in Iraqi asylum cases. And Dr. Sarah Shaban um, is um, assistant professor in the Department of Communication, Journalism, and Film. And she identifies as a critical cultural scholar and focuses her research on the intersections among media, women's social movements, and the Middle East. As a former journalist and news producer, Sarah is passionate about media literacy and the effects news media can have on the naturalization of misinformed ideologies and discourse. Her hope is to educate the next generation of journalists with the critical thinking skills necessary for reporting ethically and effectively. And we have Dr. Mohammed Kadam Shah. Um, he is Assistant Professor of Global Development Studies in our School of Business, Government, and Economics. His research and publications focus on the political economy of state building, development management, anti-corruption reforms, as well as policy analysis and program evaluations in states affected by conflict. He's currently working on two books. One is on the consequence of centralized Soviet influence, governments, institutions on conflict and state building in Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, Syria, and Iraq. And his other book is on the interrupted process of state formation in Afghanistan. Um, Dr. Kadam Shah has worked with different government organizations, local and international organizations, and think tanks on legal and policy reforms in Afghanistan. So I'm pleased to welcome um, our three speakers. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Hughes, for that. Um, wonderful introduction and a warm welcome. So the theme of our panel today is on the lessons learned from the war on terror. And so I think it's fair to ask, has the war on terror been a success, right? Has the threat of global terrorism been decreased? Has the Middle East become a more stable and pro-American region? Has the Taliban been defeated? Has Al Qaeda been defeated? And the answer to many of those questions is no, <laughs> no, not at all. Right? And so it's fair to say that there are many failures associated with the last two decades of US foreign policy. Now, you know, as someone who researches Iraq, there are many different uh, things we can talk about tonight in terms of failures, failures of that war um, and US planning of it and all of the rest. But I thought in our time together tonight, it would be useful to go back to the heart of it, to say, you know, why is it that all of these different aspects of the global war on terror, as the U.S. has understood it, have led to poor outcomes, have led to failed goals? Why is that? And for me, it comes back 
to this early moment in the immediate aftermath of the September 11th attacks, when the U.S. as a whole, and here I'm talking about both key people in the U.S. government and also I think largely the American public, failed to take very seriously, failed to be curious about what it was that motivated those attackers that day. What was it that contributed to their radicalization? And while there was a lot of conversation about the question, why do they hate us? And I'll come back to that question in a moment. A lot of that discussion was not very serious, but that question was asked rhetorically and assumed that there was no sort of rational answer to be given. And so if I was really to try to pinpoint a moment where I think everything kind of started to go sideways, I would go back to a moment on September 20th, 2001. And September 20th, 2001 was the day when President George W. Bush gave a speech addressed to the joint sessions of Congress. Um, and this was a speech that millions of Americans watched. If you can imagine, nine days after the attacks of September 11th, Americans still had so many genuine questions. Who is Al Qaeda? Who is Osama bin Laden? These were, there was not yet a lot of answers or narratives in kind of that information void. And so people were turning to President Bush with genuine openness, a genuine curiosity to understand not only who attacked us, but what are we going to do? What will the future look like? What is the response? And so this was a moment when this speech was particularly influential because the general framework of American foreign policy and how the U.S. would respond to the war on terror was not yet known, was not yet set. And this speech helped to define that framework. And it is in that speech that Bush articulated this question, why do they hate us? And this question just ricocheted throughout American discourse. It, people kind of held on to it, grabbed onto it, it became a headline in newspapers, it became the title of a book. It was a question that many people were discussing. Why do they hate us? And if you can hear in that, that they is ill-defined and ominous, right? But, well, the American people in general had very little knowledge about Al Qaeda or Osama bin Laden. Most Americans were not particularly aware of previous attacks that Al Qaeda had carried out um, on U.S. embassies in Tanzania and Kenya or on the U.S. as a whole. There were many people who had been paying attention, namely the analysts in our intelligence services, members of the State Department. There were many people inside the Bush administration who knew the answer to this question because they had been studying it. And so I want to take us to the answers that the, the analysts themselves knew. And the motivations of Osama bin Laden were not at all a secret. Osama bin Laden, in fact, was very adamant, very determined to make sure that the world knew his manifestos. He issued many different public declarations throughout the 1990s. He sat for an interview with CNN in 1997. He was someone who wanted the world to know his worldview. He wanted the world to understand his vendetta against the United States. The answer was not a mystery. And the answer of what radicalized him, what motivated him, was politics. It was foreign policy. So I want to uh, just give you a, a kind of taste, a quick snapshot of kind of the nature of his rhetoric. Now, I am not at all sort of naively ex suggesting that we should take his rhetoric at face value and take it as gospel truth, right? So his audience is the United States. His audience is also potential recruits, potential followers. This is how he wants the world to understand him. But so I think it's interesting that we look at his message because we can see what message he thinks is going to resonate with the widest number of people. And that message is foreign policy. And so even after the attacks of September 11th, Bin Laden was like, I still don't think Americans are understanding it. I better issue another public proclamation. So he issued this as an open letter to America in 2002. And he provides in bullet point form so that no one can miss it exactly what his grievances are. And he says, the answer is simple. 
you attacked us and you continue to attack us. Now, who is you and who is us in this statement? Here, you is referring to the United States government, the United States military, but he is also including within this U.S. taxpayers who fund the military. He is also including U.S. voters who vote the leaders in charge. So in his twisted logic, this is part of his justification for attacks on civilians, just to understand his worldview and his rhetoric. Now, who is us? Osama bin Laden here is presuming to speak on behalf of all Muslims everywhere. And I want to be crystal clear that he is not, right? The vast majority of Muslims around the world reject Osama bin Laden, reject Al-Qaeda, reject his worldview, his interpretation of religion, all of it. Especially attacks on civilians, which Islam is very clear, that is not at all permissible. But he is presuming to be in this role as spokesman. And he gives specific examples, U.S. foreign policy in Palestine and Somalia, support for um, India and um, uh, support for Israeli actions in Lebanon. So he's pointing to some very specific instances that he sees as the U.S. deliberately, intentionally, repeatedly attacking Muslims. This is his interpretation of U.S. foreign policy. He also adds that the U.S. supports dictatorships in the Middle East with funding and with weapons, which is true, right? So the U.S. supported dictators in Egypt. It supported authoritarian monarchies in Saudi Arabia, right? So he is also saying, look, you're supporting these really bad regimes who, by the way, persecute religious organizations, both moderate and extreme in their own countries. So in the end, his grievance, politics, foreign policy. So let's go back to the speech that Bush is giving to the American people. The American people do not have this context by and large. They want to know, why are these people attacking us? What is motivating them to hijack airplanes, to commit mass murder? What could possibly have radicalized someone to take those actions? And this is what he tells the American people. They hate democracy. They hate freedom. They hate individual rights. Now, I argue that this is a deliberate mischaracterization of those factors that radicalized Al-Qaeda and radicalized Osama bin Laden. That this is a, an explanation that is intended for the American audience to impose moral clarity on a moment of trauma and confusion. It neatly divides the world between those who love freedom and those who are monsters. Those who hate democracy and freedom so much they would kill themselves and others for it. The suggestion is ridiculous. It's, it's, it's farcical. It's hard to imagine kind of human psychology working that way, that someone would so hate democracy that they would be motivated to carry out an attack of this nature. The other, in, in my mind, the other egregious thing about this is that it presents September 11th as a moment in which history began, where there is no history that precedes it. There is no context. But I wanna be careful here because I don't mean to suggest that U.S. foreign policy in some way caused America to deserve the September 11th attacks. I'm going to be very, very clear that I'm not suggesting that at all. But by refusing to acknowledge that there is a historical context to this moment, it precludes any kind of reasonable analysis of the situation that would allow for the formation of, of sound policies to figure out how to avoid this happening again in the future. If you want to create a sound response that would actually diminish the threat of radicalization, you need to have an honest conversation about the factors that led to that radicalization in the first place. The other issue with it is that by presenting these motivations in, in such a ridiculous way as a as caricature of kind of fanatic madmen who cannot be reasoned with because who hates freedom, right? Is that it essentially dehumanizes 
those that America was viewing as the enemy, right? That they cannot be reasoned with, there's nothing rational about them. We can't relate to them as fellow human beings who are complicated, who have complex motivations, and who may you know, use those motivations to then make disturbing choices. But so dehumanization is the first consequence that comes out of this. And with dehumanization, then it opens the door for sort of a cascading effect of negative consequences. So the first outcome of dehumanization is that it led to the dehumanization or stereotype or targeting of all sorts of people who are sort of guilty by association in the eyes of the public, namely Muslim Americans or Arab Americans or simply people perceived to maybe be Muslim or Arab or, or Persian or, or any other uh, Middle Eastern ethnicity. And then, of course, dehumanization opens the door to the very worst kinds of human rights abuses, namely the CIA torture program. And, you know, not only the torture that took place at Guantanamo Bay, but the argument that the detainees in Guantanamo Bay do not deserve even the most basic legal rights, like the right to know a charge against you, the right to hear the evidence against you. That this was argued that they did not even have the right. There are people still today in Guantanamo Bay who have been there since 2001 who have never faced a charge and who will never face a charge. They're called the forever detainees. There are 17 of them. So dehumanization opens the doors to abuses like this. And while I'm going to talk to you in just a moment about how dehumanization and the failure or the refusal to consider kind of motivating factors leads to bad policy outcomes. I also want to take a moment and say um, how I think there is a, a higher like moral and spiritual calling to seek to understand even one's enemy, right? So in the aftermath of September 11th, so many Christians in America said, I, you know, I simply cannot view Al-Qaeda as my neighbor and love them as myself. That is beyond my theological imagination, right? But that's why I think Jesus was very clear that we are not only called to love our neighbors, but also specifically our enemies. And my argument here is if Jesus is calling us to love our enemies and pray for our enemies, it seems like a lesser and simpler task to simply try to understand their worldview and to simply try to understand what motivates them. But now we can go back. So by refusing to acknowledge that foreign policy was at least a piece of this conflict, it then prevented the American public from having an honest conversation about whether American foreign policy was working for us. Was it actually leading to the outcomes that were in America's interests? Or was it radicalizing enough people that we should really reconsider if it's if it's working well, if it's accomplishing what we want it to. And so because there was no open and honest conversation about foreign policy being a potentially radicalizing um, the factor, um, the Bush administration was then able with much less resistance to double down on aggressive American foreign policy. And the story of Iraq is more complicated than that and more than we have the time for today. But essentially, right, that America said, we had aggressive foreign policy. We know that it radicalized people, and we're going to now launch two wars in the Muslim world. And this, I would argue, um, made it so that our goal, which is having a stable Middle East that is more friendly to the US interests with less global terror, that we have these goals that our strategy will never lead us to, or is so unlikely to lead us to. Because now Osama bin Laden is proven correct. His narrative and his worldview looks justified. He's like, look, they're you know, continuing in an aggressive foreign policy. And war creates more grievances, right? It has more opportunities to radicalize people. And you know, the kinds of wars we were waging were not just conflicts like on a battlefield, these were neo-colonial wars of occupation where we removed governments from power, installed new governments. Like, in the case of Iraq, we got rid of their whole army, we decided to train a new one, we built, or tried to build state institutions in our image of what we thought would work best, like, deeply disruptive. 
deeply disruptive to every segment, every level of society. And these are the kinds of environments where they're so unstable and so violent that armed groups can flourish in them. Like, this is a great environment for armed extremists to operate in. So you might be wondering, okay, if people in the Bush administration knew that foreign policy was the issue, why then did they decide to pursue this particular strategy? And just very briefly, I want to introduce the idea that um, for the Bush administration, ideology played a very strong role in influencing the decision-making process. And so um, there were many different key advisors and decision-makers within the Bush administration who adhered to a particular political ideology that asserted very optimistically that regime change, like invading and overthrowing Saddam specifically, would lead to a more stable, democratic Iraq and a happier and more stable Middle East. It would be like a domino effect of positivity. Now, history has proven that was a very naive and overly optimistic philosophy or ideology, but this is indeed part of the explanation of why the US then went that route. And so just as my final, my final sort of like case study, my final example, in, in showing the kind of blowback the kind of negative repercussions that the U.S. then experienced by pursuing a strategy that was not in line with its goals is the example of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So the U.S. Uh, government had wanted to do regime change in Iraq for many, many years, even before September 11th. And so it is fair to say that September 11th kind of provided an excuse to wage a war that they already wanted to wage. But still, the Bush administration really wanted in order to get support from the American public to connect Saddam Hussein to Al-Qaeda in the context of the post 9-11 world. They wanted to draw a connection. And so they presented what ended up being false reports of intelligence, like fabricated intelligence. Um, but their, their big claim was that this man, Abu Musab al uh, was an Al-Qaeda agent in Iraq. This was like the link between the two. And they said, okay, so if Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, which turned out he didn't, he could give them to Al Qaeda because they were in Iraq. Which they, okay? But this was the claim, and that would be a nightmare scenario if it indeed it had been true. Now, who is Zarqawi? Zarqawi was a Jordanian. He was an extremist, he was someone that the US had kept their eye on for like arguably good reason. Um, but he was a nobody. He had entered Iraq, he had almost no followers, he had very little money, he had very little influence. But Colin Powell mentioned his name 21 times in his speech on the floor of the UN. And overnight, he had name recognition, he had followers, he had fundraising, he became a threat, he became a force in Iraq because the US tried to force him, tried to show that he was this missing link, and in fact he wasn't. Now, what's the problem with that? I told you that Al-Qaeda was not in Iraq in 2003, and that's true. But once Sarkawi got to Iraq, Colin Powell mentions his name, he gets all these followers, he gets all this money, he starts carrying out extremist attacks, actually mostly against the Iraqis, but that's a whole different story. Um, and after about a year and a half of this, he was like, you know what? I should go join Al-Qaeda. So he reaches out to Al-Qaeda, they spent eight months negotiating what this franchise would look like. And in the end, he became Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And so it is very fair to say that Al-Qaeda was not in Iraq and because of US action, Al-Qaeda came to Iraq. Now again, what's sort of the consequence of this? Zarqawi was killed by an airstrike in 2006, but his organization that he had created, which was called Tawheed Wal Jihad and then later became Al-Qaeda in Iraq, continued, and it continued under his successor, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And in 2013, his successor, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, changes the name of the organization to ISIS, right? And so, like this series of events, which fair enough, the US could not have foreseen, but which the US is very directly responsible for, leads to the creation of ISIS in Iraq. So just to summarize some of the lessons that we're learning from all of this, this initial, like original sin to fail or refuse to consider what actually causes people to become radicalized, dehumanized the enemy, 
leading to horrific human rights abuses. It prevented America from having a, a larger, impactful discussion about the direction of our foreign policy. It led to two wars, which had horrific outcomes for Iraq. And I'm looking forward to hearing my colleagues speak more into Afghanistan later. But Iraq is ruined as a direct result of US policy from 1991 to the present. Iraq is a ruined country, and we know it. We created fertile environments for extremist groups. We further radicalized populations against the US because of war. And the real victims of this are millions of Iraqis and Afghans. And so if there's a lesson I think we can learn for the future, I hope we are not learning how to better occupy foreign countries or better do regime change. I hope we will not need any of those lessons learned anytime soon. But I do think that the moment will come or maybe even has come already when America will feel the need to define a new enemy. And if and when that moment comes, I hope that we will remember to love our enemies to seek to understand them, not just because it leads to better policies, because I believe that is what we are called to do. Thank you, everyone. I know you're all judging my desktop, so it's fine. So first off, um, I want to say, hi, Mom and Dad. <laughs> <laughs> They're in Nashville and really just insisted on watching this. Um, so I'm going to talk about the quote, war on terror from the perspective of media. So I want to walk us through two different media frames, the first being the war on terror frame and secondly, the liberation from women frame. So I don't know if any of you have been curious about where the, the term war on terror even came from, but its roots are within the Reagan administration when characterizing the fight against terrorism in the Middle East and Latin America. As Dr. Walters already told us, it was also used in a speech in front of Congress. Yes, I just want to make sure I covered it all. <laughs> but the war on terror did a lot of things. It focused on military solutions, it demanded patriotic allegiance, it became shorthand for Bush policies, it framed the events and news. And it did not specify a particular enemy, but it definitely implied one, which several journalists did attest to. In a study interviewing journalists from USA Today, because at the time USA Today was the number one news outlet, the reporter shared how they understood the language on the war on terror and why it became ubiquitous in news to this day. The war on terror became a framing tool for America's military action in the Middle East after the 9-11 attacks, which in many ways became synonymous with the war on Islam. One reporter spoke to this idea of an, of an implied, if not explicitly, defined enemy. They said, I thought then and I think now that to say war on terror is kind of a weak and a nod. We know what we're talking about here. We're not talking about war in Basque DA or the Irish Republican Army or another terrorist organization. We're talking about Islamists, Muslim jihadis. So why don't we say that, or why doesn't the government say that? I don't know. So journalists didn't know why the phrase was being used, but they used it without any challenge at all. So this taken for granted phrasing comes from three significant steps, transmission, ramification, and naturalization. So first with transmission, journalists transmitted war on terror as shorthand for Bush policies. One reporter explained it this way. I don't classify the war on terror. The president uses the phrase. I quote him using the phrase. He has defined it a certain way. The administration has defined the war on terror a certain way. I don't use it independently of the administration using it, so it's not my responsibility to define it. That said, 
when we matched, when we, I didn't conduct the study, when the researchers conducted the study, it actually did come, come to light that reporters, including this reporter, did use war on terror apart from whenever the president was speaking. So this amplified the way that the president was describing the war and embedding it into public discourse. The next step is reification or to consider or represent something as a concrete thing. So while the policies themselves were often criticized, the frame itself was not criticized. So even when we were criticizing Bush's policies, we were still calling it the war on terror. We saw this in the 2004 presidential race when, between Bush and John Kerry, in which Kerry presented the argument of who could wage a tougher war on terror. One journalist says, at the beginning with 9-11, it started with Al-Qaeda, but eventually the Bush administration began to widen the target almost immediately. I just realized I had that on. Uh, <laughs> Bush began to talk about terrorists with local reach. There started to be mission creep very early on. So, and then following, so you hear where he's saying there, there's an understanding that the war on terror is no longer talking about Al-Qaeda. We're talking about something bigger than that now. Another, a different journalist said, you run the danger that it can become propaganda. If you allow a government to put everything and anything under the rubric of it's part of the war on terror, it's an effort to convince people that, well, you have to go along with this or else we'll all be terrorized and killed. So the war on terror was treated as an uncontested thing. Finally, you have naturalization, when a concept becomes taken for granted or amorphous. We don't even know what it means anymore. Several of the journalists interviewed struggled to describe what the war on terror actually meant, and whenever they would suggest an alternative, it didn't actually stray very far from the original concept. One journalist said, I'll try to use words like combating terrorism or battle against terrorism, but I'm sure I've used the war on terrorism many times. I try to use other words that are less likely to indicate that the war is going to have a start and an end. So why does that, why does this even matter? Like why, why does language matter at all? So like we saw in the first journalist quote, there's an understanding of who we're talking about when we say war on terror. We aren't talking about school shooters. We're not talking about the police killing black men. We're not talking about white supremacists. We're talking about Islamists. We're talking about brown people. And that association is absolutely no accident. So as Dr. Walters, I love that you went and put a lot of groundwork out there. Uh, there's an us versus them framework that's become created. And of course, that mentality existed before 9-11, but it was intensified with the media coverage following 9-11. When the rhetoric dominated mainstream news narratives, and associated it with Islam. And then it became a Christian America versus Islam. So with that problematic rhetoric uh, came an increase in Islamophobia in the Western world, especially the US, with problematic coverage that we're actually still seeing today. So according to the Public Religion Research Institute for 2015, Researchers found that 80% of ABC and CBS and 60% of Fox coverage on Muslims was negative. The dominant themes that they used whenever talking about Muslims or Arabs are oil, war, and terrorism, which probably doesn't surprise you. And since 9-11, after hijackers were described repeatedly as Arab, Muslim, brown, others, Islam became synonymous with terrorism in the media. Muslim identity was repeated in every story more than 500 times. So just to give you an idea of, of how this is different from how we convert other terrorists, there's this chart. So a terrorist event occurs. The event is labeled terrorism. The victims, of course, are portrayed as heroes and personalized. We hear their stories, we see their photos. But when we get to the terrorist, we just have to decide if the terrorist is Muslim or not. And back then, there was very, very often the speculation that the person was Muslim or associated with an Islamist extremist group. 
So if the terrorist is not Muslim and is a U.S. citizen, the terrorist is often given human descriptors, sometimes talking about mental health or how they weren't actually a violent person and telling childhood stories of when they were growing up. And they look about they look at the reason for why it probably happened, again, referring to mental illness a lot of the time. And then we treat it as an isolated event, as if it's never going to happen again. On the other side, if the terrorist is labeled a Muslim, uh, very directly linked to a larger terrorist cell, which ISIS loved, by the way, because even if they weren't responsible for the attack, they're more than happy to take credit for it and raise their uh, PR profile. The act was always connected to war on America by Islam, specifically, and it was treated as a continuing future threat which is why we still are using the war on terror, and we know what we mean when we're saying the war on terror. Again, why is this important? So from a study from 2014, looked at 146 episodes of news programs focused on breaking news by major broadcast and cable networks between 2008 and 2012. So those described as domestic terrorists in the news reports, 81% were identified as Muslims. But according to FBI reports, only 6% of domestic terror suspects were actually Muslim. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears here a little bit. We talked about the war on terror uh, framework. Now we're gonna talk about the liberation for women framework. Talking about representing the other woman. So for decades, women have often, not just Muslim women, women in general, have been uh, used as damsels in distress in need of a savior, oftentimes a white savior. Oftentimes, a, the narrative usually runs along uh, white men saving brown women from brown men. Oftentimes, it comes from well-intentioned feminism. Looking specifically at Muslim and Middle Eastern women, who they are often characterized as oppressed and docile, uneducated, self-segregated, and sexualized, whether as sex slaves or jihadi brides or belly dancers, depending on what kind of media you're consuming. A lot of these stereotypes, for those of you who were not alive, or maybe you were just born um, when 9-11 happened, a lot of what you know is probably coming from certain mediums, whether that's books or movies or news media. And that's not always correct, right? We know that media can put out a lot of stereotypes. Homeland um, is definitely one of those TV shows that does that. American Sniper is another one. Um, but it's not, but again, it's not just media, it's also us too. Even though we're well intentioned, sometimes we can fall into this narrative and make it worse. So, another study, surprise. Uh, in 2020, these researchers looked at the New York Times coverage of Afghan women. And what they found was three peaks in news coverage, which shouldn't be surprising. Uh, the first being in 2001, when Bush made the directive to invade Afghanistan. There was a major focus on women's bodies, major focus on the veil at this point. And there was the narrative that there was justification for the invasion of Afghanistan because they were liberating women. Literally, this is what they said. Uh, the second one comes during the Obama administration in 2010. Obama increased the number of troops in Afghanistan, again, with the justification of protecting women made the occupation okay. The third peak comes in 2017 with the Trump administration deciding to keep troops in Afghanistan, again, under the guise of saving women and protecting the rights that they had already gained at that point. So that's three administrations right there. So I want to take a look at some of the coverage. So these are all from the New York Times. Much of the coverage focused on the removal of the veil, which is an association that's commonly made with Muslim women. And the photographs when an, uh, an Afghan woman was unveiled supplemented with this commentary of progress, um, obviously brought on by the US, with US understandings of benchmarks of freedom. 
And these headlines from the New York Times were all written by men, except for this one, whose co-author was a woman. So throughout those three administrations, Bush, Obama, and Trump, the war on terror emphasized the responsibility for American troops to protect women and children within Afghanistan. So before 9-11, Afghan women were rarely covered in US news. Now, that's not to say that there wasn't a lot of um, documentation of those things, but the US media itself did not really do any kind of uh, coverage on that. But after the attacks, mainstream news media consistently highlighted the oppression of Afghan women, particularly their forced bailing as a human rights violation. The narrative coming from US media helped garner public support for the war in Afghanistan and used a rallying cry to liberate Afghan women. Throughout the Obama and Trump administrations, the narrative evolved into we need to keep the American troops there or else the women are gonna lose their rights. But, you know, as we know, the Trump administration eventually made efforts to uh, secure a peace deal with the Taliban and remove American troops. And as we know, as of last month, the American troops were removed altogether, which begs a controversial question right now. Did supporting women's rights stop being a priority when it no longer served U.S. interests? Similar questions have been asked regarding the invasion of Iraq and the use of women's in America's justification for war. So for decades, Iraqi women in both the U.S. and the U.K. tried to get the attention of their governments and raise awareness about the systemic abuse of women in by Saddam Hussein. But it wasn't until 2003 that the U.S. started listening, and it's then that women's lives became newsworthy when it helped garner support for the invasion. Following the U.S. withdrawal from Iraq, Iraqi women's rights were actually even more restricted than before the invasion. First Lady Laura Bush also took up this narrative on the Taliban's oppression of women and children in Afghanistan in a radio address in 2001 saying, the fight against terrorism is also a fight for the rights and dignity of women. Now let me be clear. The experiences of Afghan and Iraqi women of violence and oppression are very real experiences. The point I'm trying to make is that the US media capitalized on those experiences to garner support for the war, both wars. So liberation framing often paints the U.S. in this heroic light during a time when they were seen as especially vulnerable. Uh, in this study, what kind of liberation women in the occupation of Iraq, which uh, the researchers go into a deep study in interviewing multiple women in Iraq. One woman told the researcher, by highlighting the plight of female victims in borrowing lands, U.S. officials not only provided a pretext for military invention, but also restored the image of the United States as a strong hero rather than the victim of terrorist attacks. Speaking of liberation, what does that even look like for women in Afghanistan and Iraq? Western media operates on this idea that the image of women in society reflects the culture of that society. In fact, this picture on the left was used to convince President, then President Trump to keep troops in Iraq. You can read that in multiple, multiple places. Um, many news articles following 9-11 focused again on the bodies of women, specifically addressing the burqa and juxtaposing these images of women in Kabul in the 70s with women in, in Kabul in the 90s when the Taliban was ruling the area. So by placing these photos side by side, ooh, sorry, by placing these photos side by side on numerous occasions, there's definitely a certain um, understanding and feeling that you're going to get towards the people in Afghanistan. And, and I mean that's the way that media works. That's why imagery is being shown over and over and over again. 
And there's a lot of danger that comes with that kind of thinking. Uh, female nationalism being one of the most dangerous because it's masked as feminism. So female nationalism is basically using gender equality and feminist language to promote anti-Islamic or xenophobic campaigns. And they're usually practiced by right-wing conservative Westerners, but they're also used by left-wing, well-meaning feminists trying to be the voice for the voiceless. But I don't want us to forget that Afghan women actually have voices. So Spivak said, in the words of Spivak, can the subalterns speak? Journalists have to ask themselves, before, if, if we're going to let them speak, before we're trying to speak for them. There's a limited amount of empathy that journalists can convey to an audience, an audience that will digest whatever information we give them and pursue forms of, solid, forms of solidarity that may be well-intentioned, but don't really do anything. So the point is that radical change can only be facilitated through marginalized voices. And when the redistribution of power is made clear, I think we are beginning to learn that lesson, slowly but surely. For example, this is what the coverage is looking like right now. One thing I do want to point out, especially in these, these two articles right here, is that we're definitely highlighting the voices of Afghan women, and that is a step in the right direction. But, as I told my students, you need to look at the sources. Where are the sources coming from? The sources are either coming from women who were in the urban areas of Afghanistan, like Kabul, or they're women in the diaspora, women who are already in the United States. So we know where their ideology stands. But outside of the New York Times, we're seeing a lot more nuance. So this article came from the Brookings Institute from September 2020. And it talks about women's rights in urban areas and how they've exceeded expectations and how they really do have a lot to lose. But they also mention the women in the rural areas because those exist too, and how they're not having the same experience. And this is why it's important not to homogenize the Muslim woman. They're not all the same, and they don't all look the same. It's time that we need to stop that mentality. So urban and rural Afghan women actually disagreed on how U.S. peace talks should go with the Taliban, but only the urban women were invited to that table for conversation. This article comes from Al Jazeera and talks about the Orientalist civilizing mission of Afghanistan, um, specifically talking about Laura Bush's speech. It also talks about the thousands of deaths and millions of displaced. And it talks about the widowed women and the orphaned children who are even more vulnerable than before the men were taken from their life. Another article from The New Yorker, this one highlights the gap between urban Afghan women's experience and the rural Afghan women's experience. So more than 70% of accident death of Afghans actually don't live in cities, they live in rural areas. So life under U.S. occupation didn't look the same as it did for women who were in cities getting education and being able to work outside the home. Instead, it became very dangerous for them to get in their cars to drive to their brother's wedding or to have tea outside because they didn't know when a bomb was going to go off to the point where some of them actually come out and say that maybe life was better under the Taliban. More specifically saying, what the Taliban offered over their rivals was a simple bargain, obey us and we won't kill you. So in these interviews with some of the rural women uh, in Afghanistan, one woman was saying that they're giving rights to Kabul women and they're killing women here. Is this justice? This isn't women's rights when you're killing us, killing our brothers, killing our father. The Americans did not bring us any rights. They just came, fought, killed, and left. And while the women, even within the village, do disagree on what the rights should look like, they do agree that it shouldn't come from a barrel of a gun, whether that's from the Taliban or from 
the U.S. military. Similar uh, arguments were made in Iraq from women who were there while the, during the U.S. occupation during the war, saying some people are saying that it was better under Saddam because there was greater safety and security. You knew you would be okay so long as you didn't oppose Saddam. Now you have hundreds of Saddams. This is extreme lawlessness. So after the fall of Saddam, the U.S. and its allies failed to react quickly to provide security for the Iraqi people. They assumed that these pre-war Iraqi institutions would still be in place, um, which they were not, and instead lawlessness broke out. And the dissolution of the police and the military enhanced this lack of security. And while the U.S. was training a new, a new police force, they were doing it very slowly, not fast enough. So when the researcher questioned a U.S. official about the specific dangers against women, this is what they said. Iraqi families dealt with violence against women in their own way, keeping their women at home. This was the best way for them to deal with it. What could we do? Setting an armed guard to escort every woman? That's not possible. Our responsibility was for general security of the whole population and not towards specific groups. Anyway, I don't think women were more targeted than any other group within Iraq. There's no evidence that they were specifically targeted. That right there tells me that the liberation frame was exactly that. It was a frame that was meant to garner support for the war. In terms of lessons learned, I want us to learn that men have been trying to liberate women in Afghanistan for decades. In the 70s, it was the Soviet Union. In the 80s, it was the Mujahideen. In the 90s, it was the Taliban. In the 2000s, it was Americans. And now more than ever, we're actually hearing Afghan women's voices. And my argument and plea is that we let them call the shots. Okay, so I'm just going to go down to what my other colleague mentioned, especially Dr. Walter that uh, talked about very detailed aspects of how the United States started the uh, war on terror in Afghanistan. And uh, it's all of uh, presenting very uh, impressive uh, report on how media has been reflecting the situation in Afghanistan. My uh, presentation will be focused on how uh, like the U.S. state building effort failed in Afghanistan. Instead of uh, labeling it as a war on terror, I would call it U.S. state building, because part of it goes back to the very justification that the U.S. Uh, ended up in Afghanistan. Although initially the war was on terror, this label started to change. Uh, Counterterrorism, counter narcotics, uh, and uh, state building, especially after 2005 and 6. So um, this is the, in fact, uh, tentative title for the book I'm working with my, uh, uh, one of my committee uh, members. So we are calling it Built, uh, Built to Fail. And specifically, we are looking at how decentralized Soviet, uh, Sovietized uh, governments and institutions undermine the liberal uh, state building in Afghanistan. So, uh, in fact, uh, we are trying to uh, explain the reason, one of the main reasons, according to our argument, uh, the main reason that U.S. state building failed uh, was uh, relying on the wrong set of governance institutions that uh, wasn't compatible with the Afghanistan culture, wasn't compatible with, the, with Afghanistan history, and it wasn't only the U.S. making this mistake. In fact, U.S. repeated the mistakes that the Great Britain uh, did in the uh, 19th century, Soviet Union in the uh, mid 20th century, and then in the 21st century, US. So, with that, uh, these are uh, some of the uh, 
items that I'm going to talk about. Firstly, uh, mainly focusing on why state building failed. Second, I will uh, elaborate on that and then I will look at how and whether Taliban are learning from the history or not. And finally, I will uh, talk about some of the implications for the future of our things. So, uh, I guess I should start with this picture. And when we talk about Afghanistan these days, this is one of the first pictures that come to our mind. And the story began with this. And uh, that was, in fact, the initial uh, point, the initial point of justification for the US to even think about going to Afghanistan and starting uh, the effort to war against the terrorism and ultimately building a, a government's. Uh, Institutions or government system that would be ultimately leading Afghanistan to a liberal democracy. So the US started this process in, in 2001, and as Dr. Walton mentioned, just nine years after the 9 11, the US decided to go to Afghanistan. They invaded, invaded there, and it's been the rhetoric since then that they have been defeating uh, the Taliban and the terrorists. And, uh, some of the indications of that was that they killed the U.S. and they killed uh, some of the and no other 9-11 happened in the United States. These are, in fact, some of the points that President Biden was uh, uh, presenting in his very first speech after the U.S. troops withdrew from Afghanistan. And then the other achievement for the U.S. from the U.S. perspective was that they started this state building process. They relied on the they started, they wanted to create these governance institutions for Afghanistan, and uh, they focused on uh, creating some capacity, uh, including uh, building a national army, according to the reports that I uh, strongly suspect is that uh, Afghanistan had uh, 300,000 soldiers in the national army. Given the extent of the corruption and the uh, depth of the corruption in Afghanistan, I, doubt that it would be less than half of that available. So uh, again, uh, several trillions of dollars were spent and uh, in uh, 2,300 uh, American soldiers were killed and many Afghans uh, lost their lives and uh, uh, they started in fact uh, in 2001, uh, including me and my family who came back from Iran. They started a very different uh, experience. Um, it is very uh, funny, and uh, I, I, when I look, at, look back at it, when I was two years old, my family had to leave Afghanistan and go to Iran because the Soviet Union was withdrawing from Afghanistan. And now, after uh, 30 plus years, the US is withdrawing, and my kids are uh, having to uh, have to get out of Afghanistan. So I see. Uh, uh, a lot of difficulties in it, and especially personally. Uh, and I see that uh, in, the, uh, in the mind and uh, place of all uh, Afghan people back home. So in terms of uh, Afghanistan, so what uh, achievements Afghan did have, according also, can be uh, argued uh, from the perspective of the U.S. The U.S. facilitated the formation of a new political order. According to them, they deposed the Taliban, they removed them. And they installed the democratic system. Afghanistan could adopt its uh, 30th uh, constitution throughout its history. Eight of them officially adopted, uh, five of them not. And we have four presidential elections, three parliamentary elections, all of them uh, uh, fraudulent, and uh, there was always claim and allegation of uh, corruption and fraud in them. Human rights and women rights were uplifted. Uh, women could go to school, especially, and uh, uh, freedom of speech was very common. We had, uh, we now have, we had a lot of media that they could uh, easily uh, criticize the government. The right to protest was available for the people. The schools, hospitals, roads, uh, parks, and some other major infrastructure projects were uh, established in Afghanistan. The sports were promoted. Women and uh, men could uh, do their sport and. Afghanistan armies, number of the army that uh, I, I, I strongly suspect. So, uh, what did the US and Afghans not achieve uh, was that the sustainability of all these. And that's a major question. Wherever the US has gone, they have been doing, I would uh, look at them as good things if they, have been, uh, if they were going to be 
done in a good way. But ultimately, sustainability has been the main challenge. They have not been able to uh, lay a basis so that the country that we was meant to, uh, to continue and uh, build on that and uh, kind of uh, uh, be self sufficient and ultimately be uh, become a country that uh, can decide for their own and uh, the people who are capable of uh, deciding about their political future. So what was the consequence of all this? When the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan, we see that the Taliban, uh, the expectation was that the first I mentioned, for example, if the U.S. army leave Afghanistan in six months, the government would collapse. But it, but it didn't even take six days. So uh, within a couple of days, I, I couldn't even uh, fly my, uh, my family out of Afghanistan. They, had, they were supposed to leave by Tuesday, but uh, Taliban took over on Sunday. So anyway, so you see that the Taliban in, in some of the checkpoints in the city, and these are the Taliban in the economy, they are sitting in the uh, central bank with their gun. And uh, they have been posting a lot of pictures here and there with their gun and with their legs down on the, on the table or the, on the desk. So as a result of that, uh, the chaos started to grow and this is still going on. Thousands, tens of thousands of people were desperate to find a way out of Afghanistan. And that was because mainly uh, of the fact that they remembered what was happening in 1990. So the memories were with them. They still have that memory and uh, they cannot trust it with the Taliban. Although they are promoting this idea that we have changed and we are going to uh, respect human rights, we are going to uh, open the economy and this and that. But the people uh, have, a, have a hunch, and the people should have that right uh, to whether accept someone as their government or not. But right now, they don't have that right. It, it, it looks like the Taliban supported the, uh, the supporters, Pakistan mainly. They want, again, uh, another, uh, another time, they're going to impose themselves on the Afghan people. So this is the picture from the military uh, airline that you see that uh, more than 600 people in one flight that in early nights of the evacuation have been in. And this was a very another sad uh, picture of the people just uh, trying to play on the airplane. And, uh, that's it. So then uh, I guess uh, the question becomes, uh, but why the Afghan government collapsed? Uh, what, what was the reason? So the title of our book, in fact, is trying to say that it was doomed to be failed from the very beginning because it wasn't matching the um, after local conditions. Some other theories are kind of being explained in the literature of the development of uh, development. U.S. withdrawal basically was the factor. I mean, it can be a factor, but uh, if you look at it, uh, U.S. was going to leave Afghanistan sooner or later. They were not going to stay there forever and uh, I I have been an I missile of the idea that it should be on the Afghans to build their country. No other country in the world has gone to another a third country and built them from the scratch. So the Afghan uh, president fled the country and some people say that that was the reason. The neighboring uh, countries uh, interference, uh, ethnic conflict, insufficient aid, I think the aid would not be wasn't insufficient for Afghanistan because uh, trillions of dollars, Germany and Japan were built with only $15 billion and $6 billion uh, when the US in fact, uh, was doing this state building there. Geography, culture, corruption, I mean, all of them, combination of them can be a factor, but uh, according to us, our argument is that the US relied on a very long governance institution. And in a state of transforming and adopting uh, compatible governments and institutions with the culture and tradition of Afghan, the U.S. relied on the old, failed, centralized, and Soviet influenced governments and institutions in Afghanistan. So, uh, in the rest of my presentation, I'm going to elaborate on that. But before that, let's uh, look at what is the ideal state building in theory. What, what in theory is state building look like? So. Uh, uh, so, the state building basically uh, refers to creating new institutions or reforming the existing institutions. So, basically, you are trying to build up a system that works for the, for the people, for a given country. 
And based on that, you uh, you uh, you can look at you can kind of focus on different aspects of development. It can be social policies, institutions, political institutions, economic institutions. So uh, the core of the institution building of a state building is the governance institutions because basically governance is the basis, is a set of rules that uh, 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 societies organize themselves around it. And, and based on that, they try to resolve their disputes. And based on that, they try to make decisions. And based on that, they try, in fact, to exercise some legal rights. So uh, another key factor in the state building for the success of the state building is transforming and uh, adopting the institutions based on the global conditions. So anytime you as, uh, if you look back to the US uh, experience of a state building, Anytime they have gone to different countries to do their state building, they have uh, they have been focusing on one set of institutional setting, creating a very strong central government, uh, uh, holding national elections, uh, adopting some uh, fancy uh, rules that promote human rights and democratic ideals. But uh, in most of the cases, they have not been matching uh, matching with the with the local condition of those countries. Some other elements include uh, uh, local ownership and participation, balancing the legitimacy and reality. And this is also very key because uh, the US uh, has been making this mistake by appointing or kind of installing their royal politician as the head of that state. And then they, try, they have been trying to uh, do that in order to be able to promote their political and economic uh, policies throughout that country in that specific region. So what happens and in, in this situation is that uh, the appointed or installed uh, politician would not be able to balance the reality and legitimacy. Because he would be always be seen as a as an puppet, as a puppet or as a person who is not uh, really representing the people. Promoting long-term objective and also ensuring sustainability of course is a key factor. So what happens uh, uh, with the state building in practice is that they create some unsurface uh, reforms and some features of the liberal democracy. They emphasize on the state capacity. Uh, they uh, focus on democracy and human rights uh, to some extent, but most of the time enforcement is not really there. Uh, they uh, uh, create some market institutions uh, and there's always uh, weak checks and balances. Um, so what happens mostly, uh, one of the other factors that happen in the in practice is that the state builders basically do not break from the past. And this falls under the logic of path dependency because the, 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 institution, uh, the institution makers or whoever is a decision maker, they tend to rely on the very last uh, set of institutions for the sake of easiness and for the sake of, kind of uh, facilitating the transition. So that is in fact the mistake that the US government made uh, in Afghanistan. And based on that, they in fact created a new government, but in fact it was the old state in Afghanistan. And most importantly, it was the Soviet legacy. Soviet, uh, uh, unlike the common perception that uh, was in Afghanistan between 1979 to 1989, our historical analysis shows that uh, Soviet was in Afghanistan uh, between 19. 1930 for some period, and then Soviet became busy with the things that were happening in Europe in that time period, and then Soviet Union came back in 1950s and has been in Afghanistan, was in Afghanistan for almost 50 years. So during these 50 years, they transformed the Afghan system into a very similar uh, system to uh, Soviet Union. So I will go uh, in detail into that and showing you how it's been working. So this is the consequence of uh, adopting wrong set of institutions. So what happens, ethnic conflict was uh, going in Afghanistan because the system was very exclusive. All the uh, nationalities, all the ethnic groups were not represented in the system. Uh, corruption was soaring uh, uh, because there was no check on the government. Uh, aid mismanagement was another uh, consequence. Weak rule of law. Inefficient and ineffective service delivery and unaccountable conduct. I will just uh, talk about a couple of them later, but uh, not all of them. 
So what happens under, uh, if you adopt the wrong governance institutions, a vicious cycle of governance happens. We have some certain, some small group of individuals would be benefiting, and the rest of the community, the people would be just uh, suffering. Because uh, just the leaders would be sucking their resources, and the people would not be really uh, taking advantage of the resources in Afghanistan. So basically, a predatory state would be created, and a civil conflict would be ongoing. Uh, as in the case of Afghanistan, Taliban was in fighting with the Afghan government the whole time. And what happens, the quick scramble of uh, institutions is happening. The institutions are just window dressing and trying to satisfy the international community that we are reforming the system by the reality and nothing is uh, happening. Uh, an institutional status of uh, uh, path dependency happened because the predatory is the benefit from the existing institutions. They don't really uh, uh, transform the system and they rely on the existing system that is feeding their interest. And uh, corruption and dash votes would be the consequence of that. So why uh, institutions in Afghanistan uh, were created uh, the way they are and uh, why they uh, continue in Afghanistan. There are two sources of reason for that. One, international actors have been involved in that. Uh, they have some geopolitical interest. And I will uh, show you some uh, how Afghanistan has been subject to that. Fear, uh, uh, fear of quick changes. Uh, they fear of quick changes. Uh, they fear that quick changes will undermine their big partners because when they go to a specific country, they want to have their royal politician at the top of the state, controlling the state so that they can, uh, in the case of Afghanistan, control the region. And uh, they fear losing control, and the short time horizon is another factor. So initially, the US came into Afghanistan, and yeah, maybe their time frame was only a couple of years when they got started in Afghanistan. Local leaders, on the, at the same time, take advantage of the centralized system or a corrupt system because uh, they want to uh, consolidate their power over the people. Uh, they want to defeat the rivals because the, the state builders usually pick and choose among the actors. And finally, they want to maintain control over the people. So this is the history of Afghanistan. So throughout this history, since 17. Uh, Seven Afghanistan has been subject with uh, the subject of foreign intervention three times, and these three major powers have been involved. So the first time was Great Britain that came to Afghanistan, and all of them had been seeking some specific geopolitical interest. Great Britain came to Afghanistan and started influencing Afghanistan in 1837, and the only reason was that they were competing, they were afraid of the expansion of the Russia at that time. And because of that, they started this uh, great game. And, and based on that, the idea was that uh, Great Britain wanted to change Afghanistan from a bunch of a group of regions into a unified state so that it can use it as a buffer zone against the Russia. Then Soviet Union came in in 1950s. And you, you know that after World War II, it is easy to understand why Soviet Union wanted to influence Afghanistan. And out of competition with the U.S., uh, Afghanistan was the target for the Soviet Union. And then 2001, the United States came into Afghanistan, and uh, Dr. Walter uh, very uh, nicely explained uh, what was the reason. And uh, war on terror, democracy, democratization, state building, and also the goals. Okay, so uh, this is in fact a general picture of uh, what's been going on, from sort of institutional evolution of Afghanistan. You see that uh, in the first period before Britain came in, uh, from 1747 to 1880, Afghanistan was a was a sort of confederation uh, confederation of the regions. They were just uh, I in a, in, a, in an article that I'm working on, I call that early democracy or traditional sort of government where the leader of the country was relying on the consensus of the regions in order to get some financial and military resources to expand its region. In that time period, the Afghan king, the first king of Afghanistan, was very expansionary. Afghanistan was an empire in that 
So this gradually, in fact, Kashrani can happen and loss uh, that prestige. So Great Britain came in, and we see that the great the main shift that happened was in that period. Because of that political geopolitical interest, Great Britain, in fact, uh, centralized the Afghan state. And uh, they, they put, uh, they installed the royal politician. Uh, and then they created this top down government. They started to formalize the rules, and uh, ultimately the judiciary became centralized, the small state versus weak society. Okay, so if you look at that, the first period they had a weak state and a small society. And this pushed back against the local conditions started from that. And then Soviet Union came in, and what they did, and what is interesting among all these great powers that came to Afghanistan, they kept some of the features intact. They didn't touch some of the features because that was in their best interest. So Soviet Union, uh, you can imagine that the type of the governance in Soviet Union was very centralized, top down, central planning. So they kept those features, and what they added to it, they added a Soviet-like bureaucracy. They started to create the rules, even right now, um, the, the, the officials are appointed based on the Soviet uh, time rules. And they created a single party, centralized judiciary, central planning, formalized law, secular system, a strong state, weak society. Again, the same, they reinforced uh, the mistake that the Great Britain did. So then US came in, they formed, they kind of kept those three features, but what they added was some taste of liberal democracy. They added national election. They uh, included, for example, democratic ideals in the constitution. Uh, but very interestingly, we were democracy without any party. So, uh, uh, so if you read the constitution, you just uh, I don't know, if, I don't know how you would react. You either laughing or just being surprised at what you see. So central planning continued to be the the, the rule in Afghanistan. Formalized the rule. Uh, Elections at national level only, no election at the local level, uh, centralized judiciary, secularized, again, strongest state, be society. Okay, so this has been the story, but now the Taliban are coming into Afghanistan, they're taking over. So now the question becomes how they're going to rule and how they're going to govern in Afghanistan. So uh, they're looking for some great power, and this time uh, it is possible that China take over. Or maybe uh, Pakistan, in fact, is with them. But uh, what I guess should happen, would happen in Afghanistan, would, that, would be that they are going to follow the same set of rules. They are not going to change anything because it is in their best interest. Whoever comes in Afghanistan, and together with my colleagues, uh, we have come to the conclusion: it is easy to take power in Afghanistan. It is difficult to govern. So that is the challenge for the Taliban, and you will see that uh, uh, it will be very difficult for them. So uh, just some of the examples of uh, uh, what was in the consequence of this sort of system in Afghanistan. So earlier I said that corruption is one of the consequences of that. And this is how corruption really happens under the centralized system. Centralization is in fact a recipe for systemic corruption. So this is the definition of systemic corruption. Under a centralized system, you have monopoly of the power, you have a lot of discretion, there is no accountability, and the result will be systemic corruption. So that is one example of that. Centralization in Afghanistan has uh, promoted ethnic conflict rather than accommodating uh, ethnic, com ethnic uh, competition. So we adopted a majoritarian democracy, uh, it promoted conflict rather than cooperation. We had a, a unitary presidential system that was a gender takes all in a very divided society based on ethnicity, language, and religion. And we had a democracy without a party, and we had the worst electoral system in a divided society that is a single non transferable voting system. That we created a very fragmented parliament that didn't have any power to check and balance the power of the president, for example. And ultimately, we had a top-down system that representation was at the lowest. So, again, so throughout the history, these are some of the elements that Afghanistan has been grouping again and again. So, uh, 
the Afghan state have been going against the grain, against the uh, against the reality of Afghanistan. These are some of the aspects that's been going on, and the informal governance institutions have been surviving. Although there's been always a push from the top, from the government, to enforce some of the formal rules, there's been always some informal uh, practice going on and continuing in our campus. The first one has been dispute resolution. Uh, the last report that I saw in 2018, 75% of the people who dissolved their dispute, dispute informally, they don't tend to go to the court or, or the formal system. Uh, water management is very cool that the People in the villages, they hire a water manager, they appoint him, they keep him accountable. If he's not working, they're going to change him. So they have been doing some governance practices informally, and try, uh, they have been trying to show that uh, they're not, uh, the system doesn't belong with them. Uh, a strong wall of governance. Uh, there's been always uh, been tension between the governors, the wall of governors from the uh, 90s. And, uh, and the central government. So some of them have been very uh, successful in providing security for the people, providing some services for the people. I remember from the governor of my city, and uh, anyone who had an issue or problem, they were going to him, and he was just making a call and asking uh, what's the problem and solving the problem. And this governor was the governor in, in my city for 13 years. And other governors, uh, the central government, uh, government was just shifting them or changing their position anytime they wanted. Property rights is another thing. Uh, in a set of formal legal titling, we have a very informal system of uh, title registration that the people uh, do it in order to uh, save their uh, property. Okay. So, uh, Taliban, this is what I see in Afghanistan. Taliban are repeating the same mistake. There are, there are a bunch of terrorists initially. So if you look at them, what do you expect from a, a bunch of terrorists in Afghanistan? So uh, the Taliban are even more centralist in the sense that they are going to impose a very centralist and extremist version of uh, centralization. It is another taste with it, that is uh, extremism, fundamentalism, and most importantly, they are not, uh, they are not, they are not Afghans, they are not represent, representative of that. So they tend to create a theocracy. And I see a lot of challenge in that regard because Iran is a theocracy right now. And Taliban have a very long way to get there. And they are not going to be able to do what Iran is doing in their country, although it's not acceptable. But they will not be able to do that. And uh, the Amir, the leader of the Taliban, kind of is acting like the supreme leader of the Iran. And there's no election. Uh, there is extremist, uh, extreme interpretation of Islam with regard to the women and human rights. I don't know if you may have seen some picture of the women wearing uh, black clothes, and uh, to some extent, they are suggesting that this should be the clothing code that you should talk to. So, um, ethnic superiority I'm receiving some news from different remote areas in Afghanistan that they are uh, forcefully. Uh, displacing the uh, ethnic minorities within my city. So um, they are going to, they, are, they have very exclusive policies and uh, they are afraid that ethnic cleansing will be the result and forced displacement. So this is how Afghanistan looks right now. There are three major powers uh, around it thinking about what they should do with Afghanistan. We have Pakistan, we have China, and we have Russia. But the thing is that uh, the future for Afghanistan is very uncertain. These are some of the implications that I think about the future of Afghanistan. The interest of the regional powers would collide, and that is something that's been happening in Afghanistan for a long time. Afghanistan would be peaceful uh, if if we have the, if we have all the regional powers in Afghanistan, around Afghanistan, being on the same page, of the same interest with regard to Afghanistan, and they, you can imagine that that is not possible. Even if China, Russia, and Pakistan go along and say that okay, this is our plan for Afghanistan, there is already Tajikistan raising some of the concern and framing the argument that uh, 
future of home government should become inclusive of the Tajik ethnic group. So, uh, <clears throat> so any collusion like that would uh, turn Afghanistan into another Syria, Libya, and uh, and the US has already mentioned that we are ready to do to use our drones to uh, if there's any 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 risk of any threat to our country. China, Russia, and Pakistan would adopt uh, more destroying policies of the Afghanistan because they are not as generous as the United States. China is just going to stop the resources and they're not going to give anything back. And a good example is the countries in Africa. The Taliban are and would be the same as the other Afghan rulers uh, in the sense that they're not going to be, uh, they're not going to represent the Afghans. And ultimately, the Afghan rights to self determination is and would be undermined in the future. So, in a nutshell, the future uh, is not very promising for the Afghans. And uh, what has happened as a result of the US withdrawal, uh, to me, it would be happening, it could happen anytime, sooner or later, but it happened. It should, uh, right now, it, it should be the Afghans to decide what is good for their future, not the Taliban.